Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're switched to silent. Uh, we have received apologies today from Tavish Scott, MSP. Our main item of business today is an evidence session on the committee inquiry into Scotland's green sector. And today we'll focus on development of skills and training. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, uh, Sita Kumar, Chief Executive of Creative Skillset, Graham Fitzpatrick, Creative Development Officer with Screen Education Edinburgh, Alison Goring, the Scotland Head of the National Film and Television School, and Linda Fraser, the Beck 2 Vision and Drama Training Programme uh, hit the ground running. Um, I think I would like to start by um, asking perhaps a, a general que question uh, about the, f the focus of this inquiry was the Screen Sector Leadership Group report, um, which was uh, commissioned in response to uh, parliamentary uh, concern about the screen sector, and it's been used as the basis of uh, building uh, the new screen unit. Uh, that uh, Screen Sector Leadership report I identified a number of issues in, in the area of skills and training uh, and asked for a review uh, of skills and training, and uh, that is now underway. I wondered if you could perhaps address what you think the priority sh of that review should be, um, what we're doing well in terms of skills and training in the screen sector at the moment in Scotland and what we could do better, basically what the review should be focusing on. Yeah. <laughs> um, where to start? Well, I think where to start um, is uh, what I would like to see the priority um, is starting at the start because what we lack in Scotland um, for our sector is is the basic strategy um, from which we can um, we can get our ducks in a row and line up the training provision that currently exists um, and fill the gaps where it doesn't. We have some great initiatives that work really well, but we're not connected. The funding's not connected. Um, so if we if we can have um, when when you talk about priorities, for me the priority is the the basics um, as a starting point. Yeah, I absolutely would agree with with Linda there. I think that in the past the training provision, while it's been quite good as individual projects, it's tended to be funding led. So whatever the given priorities are at a certain moment in time, that's what's been funded. And sometimes those priorities are not even necessarily Scotland's priorities. They might be priorities that have been set elsewhere in the UK. Um, and I also think that uh, we've been quite fragmented and not consistent. And because funding's been such an issue, something that has worked very well one year will just not be available the next year, for example. So yeah, it's really, it's structural that we need to have a sort of a far more strategic approach to it and far more consistency. Yeah. You talked about Scotland's priorities. Um, are there specific priorities that Scotland has that uh, are more important here than elsewhere in the UK? I think one of the problems we've got, and actually the Scottish leadership, the leadership group pointed this out in some of their evidence, that um, our landscape can change very quickly, that actually we can have a year with a lot of productions where suddenly there won't be enough of a certain um, crew position. We're not able to fill that. Um, and that can change very quickly. So our priorities in terms of specific roles is kind of not the issue. It's more of a long-term thing. Um, so we can, we can be training people for a particular role that's a particular need this year, but actually next year that might not be such such an issue. I don't know if that makes yes. sense. Uh, Graham? Yeah, I, I'd agree with both uh, uh, Alison and Linda that, that it's a structural thing about there's some great work being going on, uh, some great schemes, particularly hit the ground running. NFTS is very welcome development. In terms of my organisation and the network we belong to, Film Access Network Scotland, there's partners in Glasgow, GMAC Film, there's partners in Aberdeen, Station House Media. We all work at a school age right up to that late teens age, uh, particularly funding like Cashback for Creativity, which is focused on uh, SIMD areas and getting low-income youngsters. 
diversion for crime, but also basically creativity used to build confidence, build skills, right through to a pipeline up to BFI Film Academy, which is a great scheme focused on 16 to 19-year-olds. Another scheme called Moving Image uh, Arts, which we've been running three years, which is really focused on a Northern Ireland A-level, uh, which is an out-of-school qualification and is a, a year-long whole, uh, whole school year uh, focus on all aspects of film, so the technical but also the, the film history and the film theory. And the big issue we have is that at the end of that pipeline, what we're really doing is preparing people for, on one level, college, and on another level, uh, university, and then they're kind of lost in that system for three, four years. They come out the other end and, and there's kind of a mass of numbers and not enough opportunity. And actually not every young person that you deal with should go down that academic route. They're actually far more suited to going into apprenticeships, uh, modern apprenticeships, uh, also new apprenticeships in terms of uh, the younger age group, of course, is the foundation apprenticeships and stuff, which we're all starting to look at. So it's about that. So that's all happening. There's a lot of good work. There's thousands of youngsters across the country. We've all worked with over the last sort of five, six years. A lot of talented ones. Uh, there's ones that want to continue and want to work in this uh, right across the creative industries because it's there's film, there's TV, there's adverts, there's there's you know there's a team here filming today. Uh, uh, it's all of that. It's all those skills. It's then matching up. Where do they all go? Where's where does the pipeline take them next? And it's not being totally connected up. And it's not through the fault of all the great people working in this area and the and because everybody's working hard, but you're kind of always full on your own your own work. So it needs that at a more strategic level. And someone that's linking everything up and, and taking all that talent through. Thanks very much. The point that you make about apprenticeships was made mm -hmm. by many of the industry professionals. Yep. We've taken evidence from a suggestion that perhaps a lot of people at university <coughs> doing media studies, but not enough people actually yep. training in the ma very many different mm -hmm. practical skills that your industry needs. Yep. Uh, Sita, would you like to make some general comments about our strengths and weaknesses? <coughs> sure. Um, I would say what you need is uh, a cohesiveness between three things. Infrastructure, before you even talk about skills, you need infrastructure. And I know Scotland has got Pentland coming up, which is great. You need content and not, obviously inward investment is really important, but you also want to make sure there is ongoing content that is being developed within any nation state. Because if you don't have that, you won't have a baseline to continually upskill people, something that is acting like a solid nursery slope. And you've got to look across, in my opinion, screen. So rather than look at film, I would look at film, television, and all the genres within television, that's children's, because children's is a brilliant nursery slope, and games. Because that way, creativity can truly flourish. People can move around between different careers. Once you've got that tripartite, and a cohesive approach towards that, and a genuine thing about how do I then attract inward investment, and Alison made the point, we all deal with this, um, you have fluctuations in demand. So you've got to have a responsive skills um, kind of business intelligence system that obviously understands the baseline of what you need, but then secondly is able to respond to changing shifts and needs because people's jobs are dependent on responding to what is needed in a moment in time. And again, you can have different genres that suddenly become very popular. Sci-fi is popular one moment, then you've got a lot of royal kind of, you know, regency type. You've got to be able to upskill and meet those needs. And I think that way people's talent and dreams and aspirations can be full fulfill. Now, in order to do all of that, you've also got to ensure, and I think you made the point really well, is how much of the education that exists is truly relevant to the changing needs of our sector. Some of it is very practical and practitioner-based, apprenticeships lend themselves. Some of it needs to be very responsive because consumer patterns are changing and digital workflows are changing. So it's about how we collaborate all of us to make sure that excellence remains excellence. So there is a lot of work to be done, but I think the first step is getting that tripartite to work together seamlessly. Sure. And do you think the, the screen unit is in a good position to do that, to, to bring together that uh, fragmentation? Is, is, is it the screen unit that should be the organisation tackling that? Yes, I think, I th yes, I think it is. I think, yeah. I think it's... it's um, 
best placed um, because apart from anything else it's across all the different elements that make up our industry and it needs there needs to be a holistic approach where we shouldn't be seen in isolation we are part of the of the whole so I think it absolutely is the screen unit yeah I really welcome the proposals for the screen unit um, because it, it, training and skills has to sit with them in order that any strategies that are put in place are um, in balance with the aspiration for growing the industry and at the same rate and the point you made about it being in, in balance. I'll just move over to Claire Baker now. Uh, thank you, convener. Just to follow on the discussion about the screen unit, um, do you, as we understand at the moment, do you feel the screen unit will have the capacity to take a lead on the skills and training um, within the sector? And how do you feel in terms of the resources that are being publicly announced for the screen unit at the moment, whether there is sufficient resources in there and that you will have a, a what you feel is the, the share of it that you that you require? I don't think there's been enough detail in what's been released so far to be able to comment on that. There's been some figures um, that have been published, but I, I don't know mm. on what basis they've reached those figures or what plans sit behind them. I understand that uh, there'll hopefully be an individual who has the responsibility for skills development who um, works within the screen unit, but I have no more information about what the, their um, remit would be at this stage. Um, I don't know too much. I have met with Scott and David. I guess one observation, just reflecting back on the changes my organisation's been through over the last two years, we've been through a bit of a turbulent time, uh, but we're coming out, is we are entirely industry-led. We work with practitioners. Our board is entirely industry-led. Our councils are entirely practitioner-led. So we are always close to the coal phase. So an observation that if there is a way of enabling that within the screen unit, that would actually be incredibly helpful and will enable the success. Mm -hmm. Because the Screen Unit um, did publish, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, it's quite a lengthy document, uh, which includes 12 action points, three of which relate to skills and training. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the detail of those, but um, Sita's comments uh, about your body being very industry-led and close to practitioners, as a group, did you have input into the 12 action points, and do you feel that the if you're able to comment on the three. So the first question is, have you had any input into the document that was published in terms of action points? And secondly, if you've, been, if you've had the chance to study them, what do you think of the three that are focused on your sector? Um, I didn't have any input into it. Um, and I, I've got the, the points here. I think from where I am with um, kind of continued professional development and practice-based training, it's kind of action point seven, which is the most relevant um, for, for the work I'm involved in. And um, I, I would, there's not a lot of, as Linda said, there's not a lot of detail in it about, you know, what the, what the plan is. And I think, going back to what Sita said, it's, it absolutely has to be industry-based. It has to be, for whatever the strategy is, it has to come from industry. It has to be responsive to the needs. And, and while there's, I don't, there's nothing wrong with what I see in, in Action Point 7. It's just quite vague. It doesn't talk about work-based um, placement training um, at any level. It talks about short course provision um, and progression of the existing, yeah, progression of the existing workforce, but it doesn't talk about how we might do that. So it just feels a little bit vague. Mm -hmm. uh, you might have seen that at the weekend the committee um, put out an interim report where we argued that she'd be an independent standalone mm -hmm. unit. Um, one of the reasons for that is concerns um, around the role of the public sector agencies on the board. Um, and we weren't con were not convinced that the screen unit sitting within Creative Scotland is the best place for it to be. Um, I don't know if the panel have any uh, thoughts about that that would relay. I suppose why, why it came to mind in this discussion is the, you're, you're stressing the importance of the practitioners and understanding the industry we have concerns that the current model maybe doesn't allow that to the extent mm -hmm. that it needs to be. Yeah, and I will <coughs> welcome the interim report wholeheartedly. Um, and uh, I think for, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk of um, fragmentation in our industry as a whole, and it feels like for training we're fragments of fragments in a way, in that um, 
as it, you know, I was invited as hit the ground running as an independent training provider. Um, I'm also now a job share um, partner in a role with uh, Back to the Union, uh, delivering short courses and uh, CPD um, initiatives. Uh, supported by the BBC. But as an independent training provider, it's been very difficult to try and maintain any continuity of delivery provision for um, the area I work in is uh, specifically looking at people who want to work in um, film and television drama um, at the entry level positions. Um, and the, the training came about because I found as a practitioner working in the industry, a real gap between people coming out of education or coming from other routes and having no route into our freelance industry. It's very precarious at the start. It's very difficult for people to get an opportunity to work in the industry unless you already know somebody who works in the industry. Um, so that's how our training came about. And in order to um, deliver that training over the past 10 years, we've had to be very agile in uh, the funding sources that we've managed to secure. Um, we've had funding from a uh, creative skill set. We've mainly for the past seven years been funded uh, via Beck to Vision, which is funded from the Scottish Union Learning Fund, thanks to the Scottish Government. Um, but other funding sources as well, Creative Scotland has contributed at times. I generally have between 10 and 15 partners um, that we have to have on board to fund our courses and we don't do very much. We do maybe you know, an average of three training courses a year, but it's a vital um, route um, for a lot of people to get their way into the industry. Um, it shouldn't be that difficult. With something which is very um, industry connected, we have industry practitioners on every course that we run and it's well known within the industry and um, over the years it's become uh, recognised um, and a useful addition to people's CVs. Initiatives like that should be part of an infrastructure that gives pathways and as Graham pointed out earlier, there's lots of good things happening but we just need to have some infrastructure that lets us connect those better and supports them in the longer term. Um, there, there's other training initiatives that we've done over the years which have been successful but there's never consistency of funds available to let us repeat it. We do great work building uh, channels and um, reaching out to people who haven't otherwise considered this industry to work in. Um, and then we kind of lose momentum as we've finished our project and there's nowhere to go for, fu for the funding for the, to repeat it and can build on that. Everything, it, mainly everything we've done in the last 10 years has been a pilot. Mm. Um, just think about talking about priorities and following on from that. It is it is the fact that we need consistency. So the kind of programmes that, that Linda's been doing, they need to happen again and again and again. We need to be training people on a continual basis so that the pipeline is is constantly flowing. Um, and that's that's been the problem. That, that as you say, we have pilots, they're very successful, and then there's nothing. So it's just that it's that real lack of consistency that's that's been the problem. I think. Okay, thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Sorry, Graham, did you want to come in? No, I was just to, to, to reiterate on, on both those points. Is it's exactly the same across kind of in education and, and that out of school sector, and then all of that stuff we do with young adults. Uh, there's been some really great work, and then it's you know most of your life's about funding, most of your life's about reporting, most of your life's about outcomes, and it's all good, valid stuff, but. In the area we're in, the big priorities we have is about diversity and inclusion. So a lot of your work is, you know, it's, it can take three, four years to turn a young person around or give someone from a, a, a BME community the confidence to come into this, this the creative world. Uh, so it's then about supporting and then a really great scheme we collaborated on with three years, uh, GMAC, Schmoo and ourselves at sea, uh, was only a year's funding, uh, which I think was in your report, the fine scheme. And it's like you just get that thing started and, and you start to make all the connections with industry. We're starting to put people from four big priority areas, which was uh, low income, young people living rurally, which obviously we do work in the Highlands as well, along Weedon Court. You know, they're so isolated. So it's like it's a different way of working who still want to come and work in this industry and stuff as well. Young women, uh, disability and also BME. And that was a full on year with 12 young people to get them really ready. And they're all now continued in the industry. But then the funding runs out. It's just that it was all to do with one off. A uh, bit of money came from the Scottish Government, the Film Skills Fund, and then it doesn't repeat. So it's all these things that there's great work there, 
and then year on year you're struggling just to survive. You know, even even in our org, myself, I, I'm a three day a week person running an organisation mm -hmm. because we don't have the infrastructure to keep it going. Uh, you know, f we're a full time team, so mm -hmm. it's things like that. It's it's a serious look across the board, going what works and let's really support that. Yeah. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to start off by um, asking Sitha um, about creative skill set and um, the training levy. Um, you obviously collect a training levy um, from those um, organisations that are over creating productions over a certain budget. I wondered how um, that is distributed um, to the best effect and how you represent Scotland um, with that money. Sure. Um, so the way we work with the training levy, I come back to the point I made about everything we do being industry-led. So let's, I'll just use as an example the high-end TV levy, <coughs> because all of the levies work in fairly similar ways, but high-end TV, I, I think, collects the maximum amount at the moment, and then film comes second. And it's linked to the tax credit, as you know, it's a voluntary levy. So we do the collecting, and then we have a council that's entirely represented by industry, the council rotates, and we look across skill shortages across the UK and where the pain points are, and whatever money there is, because the truth is right now, the business is booming so much that even with the money we have, we can't keep up, and there isn't enough, that's just a fact. And in fact, everybody is talking about shortages and gaps. But within the money there is, we work we try to work UK-wide, looking across skills gaps and shortages to meet the skills needs. Specifically areas where I know we've done quite a lot of work in Scotland would be with Trainee Finder, where we make sure we, we actually come up here to recruit, and that's my understanding, I've talked to my team in both film and high-end TV, and we try and ensure that we get trainees that work across the UK, because to be honest, the industry is UK-wide, we need to work in a UK-wide way, in a collaborative way. So that's just with the training levy. And then there are other initiatives a training levy does, which is it does things like make a move. And in fact, we've had a significant success with one particular Scottish candidate. I think she's working in, on Les Miserables. I don't want to mention her name, <coughs> but she's being moved up to be a producer. So we have different initiatives. And each of them is to try and avoid what both of you are talking about, which is take a strategic look where are the skills gaps and shortages? What are the interventions? And every month, we set, every year, forgive me, we set a strategy looking at where we need to intervene and why and what impact it has. Does what we do work? Because if it doesn't, we need to know and we need to respond with agility to what the needs are. Okay. Um, so uh, is there actually a Scottish pot of funding? And, and if there is a Scottish pot... Do you know the allocation? And, and it doesn't work like that. We look across the whole skills needs and we look across all the money. We haven't disaggregated money looking at where is money coming from Scotland because productions work everywhere. And so what we tend to do is we just collect the money and then we ensure where the gaps are and we distribute it because, you know, we do that with Northern Ireland, we do that with Wales and all the different regions. Okay. And just on that one, you yeah. might not be aware, but we've been given money f at sea from the high-end TV levy to work alongside Linda, doing a hit the ground running at yeah, the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, which is which is basically to take a group of six young people living in poverty that were working. At, so, at the end of their cashback journey with us, uh, they'll do a special hit the ground running at the end of this year, uh, moving them into high-end TV. So things like that are very welcome, but it's it, it just randomly comes, you know, and it's like... Okay, so just a wider question to the panel. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to um, apply for the, the funding that is allocated towards Scotland for um, from, the, from the levies? There, there's different, there's different strands, isn't there? There's different um, approaches that Creative Skillset has to, um, to their funding. At the moment, as far as I'm aware, there are no funds available to apply for. There's a different approach in that, as um, Sita said, identifying specific areas and um, uh, asking for applications from strategic partners. So there's a uh, there's a variety of different approaches that they have, which we respond to for um, for the funds. But but also what I would say is um, one of the challenges that we have as training providers is the model that um, Creative Skillset has for um, distribution 
distributing the funds based on skill shortages is, it's kind of too late by that point because when there are skills shortages in areas such as, you know, and I speak from specifically film and television drama, but if there are shortages of first assistant directors or production accountants or um, different higher um, positions, um, that the change isn't going to happen overnight. Um, what we would like to see is an infrastructure in Scotland which allows us to to train everybody all the time, <laughs> have an, a, um, a strategy that identifies all of the different areas because there's such a diversity in skills required to make a television drama. We need to have channels and pathways for new entrants to receive quality training and support to grow that base so that we don't have the same um, consistency of skills shortages that we're facing in Scotland at the moment. Um, 40 years ago, uh, Scotland led the way in um, designing a model for um, on-the-job training called the NETS programme, which has uh, been delivered on and off for the past 40 years, subject to funding being available. And it's widely respected in the industry as a great model for um, quality um, reaching out to people to apply for it, giving people an opportunity to work across all the different um, areas of film and television. And that's key for us in Scotland as well. Practitioners work on both film and television drama, where, you know, in other areas of the UK, they might uh, specialise. And a lot of the funding um, opportunities that come via the different funding pots that creative skills that have are specifically only for film or only for television drama. So as training providers, it's difficult because you, when you apply for funding, it's maybe specifically to answer a need for film. Or, and when I work with new entrants, we need our new entrants to work across film and television in order to be best prepared for life working as a freelancer in Scotland. Um, so can I just confirm what you're saying? It would be great if skill, creative skill set could widen the criteria um, so that the application for funding could actually reach um, those skills that are required in the industry overall? I, I don't know that it's necessarily just creative skill set's responsibility yeah. to do that. It would be my aspiration for the screen unit that yeah. it's all down to the strategy that has to come first. Okay. And then, you know, we th there are various different funding pots that from creative skill set, Creative Scotland, Skills Development Scotland, yeah. the apprenticeship levy um, is coming. Uh, what would be great is to have a skills strategy and then look at the funding sources and perhaps pool those or um, find a way that we can make sure that each level of intervention is covered and supported. It's easy to ask for more money, more money, more money, but um, my observation is that we could be um, working a lot more strategically already and make sure there's no duplication of provision and that instead we, we have it um, all covered. Just for the sake of the committee, very briefly, just clarifying a couple of things, because I'm not sure how much um, you're aware. Uh, I came on board about two and a half years ago, and I'll keep this really short, and I, I came around the time we lost 80% of our funding from government. So we've been on a path to modernise the organisation, be entirely industry-led, as I said. We now get money from industry levy, that's high on TV, film and we get a little bit from children's, and we get a small amount of money for non-scripted. We recently won, about last year, the BFI 10-point uh, plan award. That focuses quite a lot of infrastructure, i.e. how do you build the infrastructure for the future in terms of skills. We've, in this period, refocused our vision and mission to only do a screen, but in practice, because the money is limited, a lot of what we do, because of the way, the source of the money, is focused on film and high-end, but those are the areas of growth. I'm well aware that non-scripted, which covers a multitude of genres, actually is a very important nursery slope, and we're working out how we generate income to invest in and support effectively that big area, because it covers a big bulk of the television schedule. The other area I'm looking at is games, but we are, have gone through a very challenging period and we're emerging. But the one thing we do have now is a coherent strategy and we are trying to work strategically and smartly with partners across the UK. That is something. So I would welcome if there was, you know, in the nicest way, an industry-led creative Scotland, an opportunity to look across and think, These are, this is what we've identified, what have you identified, how do we work together to win together? Because in the end, that's what success is for the industry and the individual. Okay. Thank you. Um. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, we've heard evidence uh, to the committee that jobs that are available in the screen sector should be more widely promoted. Um, because I do think that even going through school myself, you're not made fully aware of all the, 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 the sheer breadth of the opportunities that are available, all the different types of career, uh, the options that are actually available to you. And I was just really interested to get your thoughts on how do we or how does the screen unit essentially do something about that? How do we change that and better promote as I say, all the, the sheer breadth of roles that are available. That was a work in the past. Um, again, kind of one-off pots of money uh, to do uh, outreach work. We did roadshows going around Scotland, um, you know, free to attend, open to all uh, uh, <coughs> seminars, looking at all the different roles that there are in film and television uh, drama, to, just for that particular section of it. Um, We've done work trying to connect with uh, the college and university courses again to go in because we do find that there's a focus um, in FE and HE where students come out with a narrow view of um, being a writer, producer, director <coughs> or camera operator. And of course, there's so much more. Um, uh, so we have tried to kind of <coughs> uh, find ways to address that, but only in very small and one-off ways. Uh, so that there are kind of developed models for how that can work, but mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think um, it's come up in some of your committee sections before about um, in FE in HE maybe CPD for lecturers where we could um, maybe there's a framework that we could build there to um, enable them to better understand the breadth of the. Uh, different roles that are available but also we have to remember that it's not just about media courses the mm -hmm. skills that we require are across the board we, we've done some work with a career stall uh, reaching out to FE colleges where we try to encourage people who are studying to be accountants or plasterers or electricians to say think about this industry as well um, the difficulty is, of course, we can't guarantee that there's there's going to be work, but we do struggle, um, for example, with the Outlander training programme where they offer trainee placements for electricians and plasterers and painters to try and find a pool of people who will consider working in our industry and transferring their skills. So I think uh, a film education programme would certainly help people see this as a viable um, option. And I have to say, I think, I think we need to start earlier as well. I think we need to be in schools. Um, I, I uh, have been in to do a school talk um, with Interfilm, um, and it was, it was fantastic. And I was talking about my previous role in production, so it was very specific. Uh, but that was, again, kind of a one-off. I don't know how many they managed to do. Um, and interestingly, just last week, I received an email from... A, media teacher in Falkirk who was keen to connect with the National Film and Television School, again coming in to talk to the pupils about what the, op what the possibilities were for career opportunities and what the pathways were and how they should be preparing. So I really think there's a lot of work to be done there, engaging with, with schools and with parents and careers advisors, because you know traditionally parents were trying to keep their kids away from this. Um, and while it is still a precarious industry, it's a precarious world and you know we live in an environment of zero hours contracts and portfolio careers. So actually, perhaps working in the creative industries and in, in the screen sector is not as dangerous as it might have once been seen. So I think, I think there's work to be done there. And also, if we're talking about diversity, then really we need to start a lot earlier than we have been. Yeah. I'd echo that. I think, I think there, is, there is good work uh, in certain parts of the country. There's a lot of good work in Edinburgh because we also we, we're heavily funded by Edinburgh Council. Uh, from the, the Communities and Families Department, f essentially Education Department. So we have a responsibility to support all of the Media Studies teachers uh, in Edinburgh with CPD and also their classes with what this industry is. I think the BFI Film Academy scheme has been brilliant for the last five years, particularly as a qualification as part of it now, which uh, has elements of skills, uh, skill sets, occupational standards and stuff. So you're teaching young people between 16 and 19 what, what's required in times of time management, what, what's required in times of risk assessment, just working practices and stuff, but also a big part of that whole scheme, and we do it later years on our cashback stuff, is we do actually teach here's all the roles. So I think mm -hmm. there's it's done kind of hodgepodge. There'll be good stuff in Glasgow, good stuff here, good stuff in Aberdeen and Dundee, elsewhere it's maybe a bit sketchy 
And then you're also talking about reading through your report and stuff. There is a big issue about the qualifications in the school system in Scotland. Uh, a major issue. We we run three different types of qualifications at Screen Education in Edinburgh. None of them are Scottish. So it's Arts Award for that more participatory stuff, which is uh, Trinity London. So it's an English-based uh, qualification. Runs in a lot of arts organisations up here now. We run the Northern Irish A-Level, which has been rated the last 20 years the best uh, film qualification for that for any young young person uh, right up to kind of leaving school age uh, in Europe and, and it is really good and it covers all of the areas it also specifically focuses on young people being creative as well so they rather than just working in groups which they do they also all make their own content and and not just down to doing it in teams they physically actually do all the roles themselves so it really focuses as well as film history film theory because uh, it's forgotten that this is a this is an art form as well mm -hmm. uh, and here that's kind of mixed up as a as a literacy which is a big issue and although it's valid that you learn about the media and you learn about radio and you learn about other things, you learn about uh, uh, the media in terms of print and stuff, there are all different things. And, and film actually is like the poor relation has been for many years, where in a school system you can learn drama, you can learn music, you can learn uh, art and design, you can learn dance. And every one of them is treated as their own standalone creative art form. And actually, you can't teach any of them unless you've studied one of these subjects before. Whereas what we have in Scotland is you have English teachers teaching this subject. So there's a lot of CPD that orgs like ourselves do eh, just to try and upskill. But there's there's all these other elements that young people are missing out. So it all starts, it all starts, I'd say it starts right at primary school mm -hmm. in terms of what, what's actually needed. And again, it would have to be that, that film unit taking a lead but at the same in the same breath because uh, we're talking about earlier you're talking about standalone unit it also has to be understood with a, at a government level that there's elements that make up all of us that are working in this area teaching young people there's elements within creative scotland that aren't the film unit so there's things like the the creative learning team there's things like the young young people's part of it you know your cash back elements things like that so that there has to be a you could basically, basically, for our side of things, you could throw the baby out with the bathwater by having the standalone unit, unless it's looked at on the, even a strategic level of within the government, realising there's pots of money and different interests. So this committee talking to education and things like that, and, and getting it right across the board. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, thank you. Actually, you've introduced the subject I was very interested to discuss. I'm sorry we don't have Rick Instrel this morning, who was going to be here, who submitted quite a detailed paper on yep. the educational yep. subject, which also came up in evidence a fortnight ago. Aye. And I think it's, it's a very interesting mm -hmm. point, because when you talk about dance, drama, literature yep. and media, it occurred to me that it's a long time since I was at school, but mm -hmm. the point was there was a body of work that existed yep. uh, historically in all of these things going back centuries. Mm -hmm. But even when I was at school, the body of work that existed in film was more limited. But we now have a century yep. uh, of film, yep. world film mm -hmm. as well, you know, a whole international culture stream which is available potentially to be equally as mm -hmm. substantially represented within the curriculum uh, as any of these other art forms. And not only that, but of course, all the techniques and skills and different ways in which that is approached, all of which I think combine to, to my mind at least, to make potentially um, a very challenging and significant uh, and relevant uh, mm -hmm. curriculum syllabus. And I'm interested to know, because you made reference to it, and it was also in uh, Rick and Stroll's paper, yeah. that Scotland does seem to have to be slightly behind in this regard, and that the conversations that have taken place haven't really got past the SQA, who kind of, in a, in a sense, dampened down any yep. uh, interest by government, potentially, in trying to em emulate the experience that's been being pursued in mm -hmm. other parts of the United Kingdom. And I, I think you were partly addressing it, but, but where would you see within the curriculum potentially what the the kind of parameters of what would be very relevant would be? And I suppose my second question of that is to the Outlander thing that's been referred to. We, we had a, the opportunity to go and tour the, uh, the studios. And it was fascinating to see um, all the different mm -hmm. uh, creative skills departments that have been set up 
and people actually working with no previous experience, but now the specialised mm. experience in carpentry or in plaster work or in costume or in, in any other of the different ways that were established there, as a commercial function of that production, uh, just renewed, I saw this morning on Twitter, for another two seasons. So if it's brought 300 million in another three, in three seasons, possibly another 300 million into the Scottish economy going forward. That long-running series television seems to be a key to the content aspect you were talking about earlier. Is, it, has it, is that as a function of a production or is there a way of having that cart before the horse? So there's the curriculum bit and the way in which you try to build these skill sets up. Do they, I think possibly your argument was you need the content before you can actually be certain you can sustain these two different, uh, these development of these two skills. So probably Graham to you in the first instance on the, mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. academic part. And on, on, the, on the school part, there's, there's also that step back from just this the focus just about industry and about jobs and all of that. There's also another aspect of uh, just about health and well-being and just about being creative. And, and as you all know, one of the key factors for a young person's learning now going forward, just with changing landscape with jobs and things and uncertain futures, is creativity skills. So at the heart of filmmaking is creativity skills. At the heart of filmmaking... Uh, in groups is about group work. It is about learning from others. It's about appreciating others' opinions and stuff. I mean, we've worked in Polmont Prison and stuff, and actually, and had really great experiences. People that have that have never listened to anybody in their life, and actually suddenly taking that. So it's it's taking it in that broader sense of it is it is an art form. I would actually argue it's the most accessed art form by young people mm -hmm. today outside the popular music. And interestingly, popular music's not really taught in schools either. So it's kind of music stuck in the 17th century. And it's and it's it's just about being relevant and it's about those transferable skills and stuff as well. The rest of it comes later. I mean, we've worked, I think we talked it up the other day, I think we've worked with about 3,000 young people over the last six years at sea. There'll be a small percentage of heading into work in this. The rest, it's about just... Some it's about turning life around, some it's about re-engaging with education, some it's just about giving confidence, some, you know, I like this, it's a hobby, I like film, but I'm going to go and study something else. So it's, it's, it's to look at it on that broader sense of not just to think, because I, I remember we've had this question a lot down the years, what's the point of training loads of people if there's no jobs? It's the same argument I always give back is, why do people have a passion for football? Why do you start football at eight-year-old? Why do people play until they can't walk anymore? Why do people coach for free? Because it's a love of the game. It's just it's keeping active, it's keeping healthy. A very small percentage will play in the SPL. You know what I mean? And so it's the same for art forms. It's, they're about life as well. People are allowed to just appreciate dance and music and stuff as well. Uh, but certainly what would be great is a lot more productions, <laughs> a lot more films, and there's, there's loads. There's a whole other debate there about, you know, there's a... Once you're in this industry, uh, a lot of us that are in education are also filmmakers and you kind of have to be in education to survive because you, there's a block from going from shorts to features because we've got no kind of infrastructure for low budget features in Scotland. There's all of these things as well all need addressed going forward really to, to raise the game for everybody. Okay. And the broader outlander point, would anybody like to take that? Um, if you mean uh, about Outlander giving fantastic opportunities to train specific skills in Scotland that we don't have, then um, it, it's been a fantastic vehicle for that. And when it comes to placement-based training, work-based training, which is you know, widely recognised as what works best for our industry, people have to come with certain skill sets to begin with to then be a new entrant in our industry. Uh, having a sort of stable vehicle for that training delivery is very helpful. Um, but, but it was a concert. I mean, what's happened there is a consequence of content existing and a commercial requirement to actually require the skill sets that came from it. I mean, hopefully some of those skill sets will now be with people who are already leaving Outlander to go on to other places within industry and be potentially available to other productions that come to Scotland. Yeah. But, but is the route to that kind of training and development opportunity as a function of the content already being here and that then being the opportunity that creates the the skill sets, or is there a way to do it the other way around? As I think I was trying to understand. I, I kind of think it's. I think it's both. I think, as 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 Sita says, you know, we need the we need the content so that people can have work, 
based training, uh, placement based training, and I think that. Outlander is one of the few continuing dramas, and even it, everyone has to wait to find out if it's going to get recommissioned. River City is the only continuing drama in the country. Um, so we need more content, and we need more content that is going to be repeated consistently so that actually can build up training, as they have done in Outlander. People have moved through the ranks and, and have got you know, full-time jobs there and indeed elsewhere in the industry. Um, but at the same time, we need to build up the workforce so that we can attract more work into Scotland. So it really is... It's both sides of it, I think. And is that potentially what Pentland and other studio capacity opportunities offer? I mean, from, from that skill set development, what is better? Uh, the commissioning of a seven-year international streamed television series with the certainties that that projects mm -hmm. forward or um, a major Hollywood production locating in Scotland out of Pentland with all the post-production facilities available there too, but as something of a one-off production that then depends on the next thing coming. You're almost saying that the continuity aspect uh, is, at, the, at this stage and where we're at, probably the most beneficial thing that we can, we can achieve. I, I, I think so, but I, then again, I wouldn't want to, to say, let's not have the Hollywood production. So I, I, can't, I don't really want to choose between the two. I would say I from a trader point of view, the, the continuity yeah. is a useful thing um, because the demands on kind of one-off uh, feature films, is, it's much more fast-paced and uh, much less time for work placement training right. as such just in terms of the dynamic and the difference between how the speed at which television is made versus the speed at which films are made. But that's just from a training point of view, obviously from an industry point of view. Um, you need the colour as well. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah see that. I would say you need an ecosystem. You need both. You obviously need the continuity, and obviously River City is great because it's a very brilliant nursery slope for drama. And again, it's, it's deciding do you want to focus on fiction, which is drama and in its multitude of forms, and film? Or do you also want to break out into you know, what it means for post-production, visual effects, animation? You've got a thriving game sector in Abertay. How do you join it? Because there are people who like to move across. There's passion. I mean, you made a brilliant point about hobby and passion, which is so true, because when you're very, very little, it's feeling that that passion can be ignited. It's feeling that actually I love it, because at that age, you don't know about jobs. But if you are allowed to nurture that passion, you could end up being somebody who is a world stage creator, and why not? Yeah. Just one final question. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just thinking about Pentland then. Yeah. I mean, uh, Ward Park Studios has got four um, studios within it, all of which are committed to Outlander and therefore developing skill sets, but not available to anything else for as long as Outlander runs. Pentland is looking at a seven uh, studio, seven shed studio capacity. Is it important then when that happens that all seven studios in the sense of the mix of the business they develop aren't all just given over to long-term continuity, but that we, we need to ensure that that's a good, healthy thing they have, but there is a balance potentially of big feature films still having the capacity to come in there and not find that we've built something new, but an American series has now completely monopolised all the capacity that it has. Or, or is that just a wish? Is that a nice problem to have? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, okay. Fine. Fine. I would also say it's not just about the studio, though, because um, it, it's the commissioning conversation again. You know, having returning Scottish series is a great uh, yeah. training ground. Um, I worked on Taggart for many years, and we missed the opportunity that it gave a lot of um, crew as well as uh, writers, directors, to to um, and actors. Um, yeah, we missed. Okay, all right. Thank you. Sorry. Just by way we have a supplementary, Alison, are you able to tell us a little bit more about how the National Film and Television School will help um, change the, the landscape in Scotland? And are you able to share any of your plans with us? Um, yes, we uh, we had our first course last week, so the doors are officially open. Um, it was a course in documentary, uh, and that's one of the things we haven't really touched on in this, but but certainly the, the film school is going to be offering courses across film, television, um, drama, documentary, eventually games, hopefully as well, um, technical and editorial, so quite a broad, a broad range. And actually, just thinking back to the conversations we've been having about funding and consistency and priority-led things, we're in the very good position that we can, because we're not dependent on 
funding in the same way that other training providers are, we can we can provide whatever the industry wants as long as there's demand for it and we can we can develop it and deliver it, we can do that and we can do it consistently so that actually we do a course this year, it's very successful, we can run it again in six months or a year's time. And I think that, I hope, is going to make a real difference that actually once we... Once we've sort of gone through our first year and seen how the courses have been received and what the demand is and what the response is, we can actually start to um, work out exactly what are the key things that people want again and again. Um, I think we are. We know that we're going to be delivering some some of the things that they do in Beaconsfield because they're the courses people want and people are now going to be able to do them in Scotland and not have to travel down there. Um, but we'll also be developing local. Um, content locally for Scotland. So already we have plans. We're doing um, some art department courses, uh, an introduction to the art department, which is a five-day course, which was, is likely to be aimed at art school graduates, possibly architecture graduates, people who've worked in graphics, um, but, but a sort of very high level um, in terms of the quality of it and the detail. So it's not, it's not a general introduction. It is quite specific, so that when people do a course like that, they will then be well placed to go in as a trainee or in a, 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 an assistant. And I'd like to be developing that for different departments so that we can actually have a kind of raft of introductory courses, um, as well as the other high level stuff that, stuff that we're going to do. Right, thanks very much. You'll be pleased to hear that uh, the committee wrote a letter in support of the Channel Four, uh, the Glasgow Channel Four bid, <laughs> and we cited the presence of your uh, film and television school as uh, part of Glasgow's many strengths. Well, that's <laughs> fantastic, and I hope that if Channel Four comes, that we're going to be able to build that partnership. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Um, earlier on, uh, Sita, uh, you'd mentioned that uh, in terms of your own organisation, it took a couple of years to get that uh, uh, transition round after you lost the, uh, the government funding. Uh, so in Scotland, when this uh, screen unit comes forward, how, what is your anticipated timescale uh, for, uh, for things to start uh, operating the way that you would like them to see operate? Um, I think it's a bit difficult to compare the two because I walked into a situation where I lost, as I said, 80% of my funding and the organisation covered a very broad footprint across creative, so it covered advertising, fashion, publishing. So what we needed to do was actually recalibrate and decide we're going to focus on screen, and we looked at the reason why very carefully, because it's a very fragmented sector, we heard that. It's a buoyant sector, and it felt like there was a, there was a potential need to do three things really well. And just briefly, the three things we think we need to do really well UK-wide is be really clear what the skills gaps and shortages are so we can be responsive. Also horizon scan and have a clear narrative around screen, a screen skills, so there's a co coherent narrative across industry and government, which is really important. The second thing is, I think we've touched on, is how do you get people to enter the industry, and that has two planks. One, how do you provide careers information online in a portal, so a wealth of job role mapping and the outreach we touched on, and then enable people, and again, you made the point, it takes four to five years for somebody to feel confident that they can navigate what is a portfolio career. So that's and then the third bit is about CPD, because in our world, because of the speed of change, um, <coughs> I always use an expression, to stand still you have to learn, because the world is shifting so fast. And obviously, how do you define relevance? And again, those are points you made. So I think it's because we went through a really painful period of not having money and recalibrating our strategy and figuring it all out, it took us two years. I'm hoping if the screen unit is set up with money, the right leadership and the right remit, it will take a little bit of time to build up momentum. It should not, I hope, be as painful as it's been for us, because it shouldn't be. You know, thank you. That's, <laughs> uh, you mentioned, and others have done earlier, regarding the industry being uh, too fragmented. Um, do you see, a, uh, well, is there an argument uh, for the industry to, uh, 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 to kind of not so much downsize in terms of the various organisations and the various strands that are there, but, uh, but for a more uh, cohesive approach in terms of uh, some of the organisations potentially uh, <coughs> joining uh, so that they can actually kind of move forward uh, and be stronger to do that? Or do you think the, uh, the level of, uh, of fragmentation there is actually fine, but then with that overarching uh, screen unit, then things will be better? I think I, I feel that it's, it's about bringing people together. It's not about simplifying. 
it's not about simplifying it in terms of making several groups into one group, but I think it is about communication. And I think the thing with Scotland is that we are um, small enough that we should all know each other and be able to speak to each other and are able to do that. So I would really hope that the, the screen unit, that whoever's responsible for the strategy, the skills strategy, uh, will kind of be there to lead a forum where we can all meet together and we can talk <coughs> about... Um, make sure we're not duplicating, we can make sure we're joined up and that we can you know, talk about best practice. So I think, I think it's more about communication than, than kind of streamlining, personally. Agreed. Okay. From one of our earlier um, evidence sessions, um, Tommy Gormley um, said that uh, in terms of the of the whole industry, uh, he gave the comparison that uh, think of it as the shipbuilding industry. Instead of launching a ship, you're launching a film. Uh, and already today, uh, you've spoken about the various other aspects mm -hmm. that required joiners, electricians, plasterers, and the whole, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, and I had this discussion last week uh, with uh, through the SFA cashback uh, scheme in one of the schools in my constituency, because it's a similar idea. Uh, not everyone is going to be, uh, be the footballer, not everyone's going to be the actor, but it's everything else that's, yeah. that's behind. So on the issue of the, uh, of the careers uh, advice, mm -hmm. uh, I think you touched upon this, Alison, on the issue of, of the careers advice um, and the, and the, professional, the continuous professional development, um, what would you actually like to see happen to try to get that message over uh, to, to encourage... Um, well, to encourage uh, parents, but also uh, also schools and, and, and teachers, that, uh, that there is a, a wider aspect mm -hmm. to the industry. It's not solely about those who are performing in front of the screen. I think it is. It is about it's about going into school. It's about forming relationships with careers advisors, and so that when people are talking about becoming an electrician, they know that one of the places they could be an electrician is in the screen sector, um, and the same, you know, accountants, all those all those jobs that are transferable that we've talked about, and also just as as Mary's touched on, you know, the the wealth of jobs. You know, we aren't just directors, writers, producers, um, cinematographers. You know, m those of us who worked in production have had lots of other jobs and found them really fulfilling um, as a career. So it's about getting that message across. And I think and I think it needs to be in schools, it needs to be with yeah, careers advisors, I think. Um, we created already and we have in our website, which we are overhauling to make it simpler and more intuitive, we've got job role mapping for certain areas. We've got a little bit on high end, we've got visual effects, just showing the visual effects family. Uh, across factual production and what we want to do is actually make sure that we are mapping the range of job roles across screen and in a very simple way so someone who's never ever been who doesn't even understand our sector understands how it might work and then they can delve if they want to so there's different levels of curiosity the reason we think that's important is and at least you have somewhere to point to and then I agree with the point you made Linda and I think you made Alison and so did you about the outreach you have to keep communicating at all levels schools Interfilm does a lot of work, but there are others. And we've also got to talk to careers advisors. We've got to also enable people to realize the wealth and then have confidence. A lot of people think the world, this sector isn't for us because for years it's been really hard to get into. For years it's felt it's all word of mouth. For years it's been difficult. And I think now there's genuinely everywhere a recognition that we need to widen and have a, a very broad thank God, skilled workforce, which is a good thing, but how do you convey and enable people to truly believe that this could be for them? I think that's going to be a lot of work. Uh, I mean, this also sounds as if it's not be quite expensive, so how much additional resource uh, would you anticipate would be required to do this? I think it, it needs to be proportionate with a growth strategy for our um, industry that, and it's the role that the screen unit leadership can play in um, ensuring that whatever investment <coughs> is in education and training is proportionate to the ambition that's happening elsewhere seeking <coughs> inward investment and it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a long term um, strategy that's required for growth and proportionate. Mm -hmm. To bring in other members, if you don't mind, uh, Richard Lockhead. Thank you very much. 
<clears throat> I'm trying to get a handle on uh, to what extent generating the supply of skills would attract productions to come to Scotland, as opposed to hoping the productions come to Scotland to help us train up people for the future. Uh, so I'd like you to comment on that point. And related to that is, I take it that 20 or 30 years ago, CGI was perhaps the, the big thing, and the countries that trained up people in CGI would help attract big productions. Are we thinking about the skills that are required given the fast development of the industry in 10 years with technology advancing and how we can get ahead of the game so that we've got the skills available and then when the productions which are expanding all around the world are looking for the right skills, they'll think, let's go to Scotland, that's where the skills are. So that's my question. Um, on the first part of that, you need to have the productions to train the people. So it's... Um, uh, in answer to your question about, you know, will having having trained crew will certainly encourage productions to base here, but to get to that point, we have to have the productions to train people on. So it has to be a strategic growth um, uh, strategy. Um, but also uh, having kind of um, trainee ships, having apprenticeship systems, which um, you can offer to productions that come here or indigenous productions having the infrastructure to have um, done the outreach and selected the trainees to be able to offer them onto the production is an incentive for productions. Um, and really, it's the infrastructure that we need to be able to have those trainees <coughs> ready when productions come, because generally it's quite short notice when we have productions appear and op training opportunities um, arise. I think on the on the subject of kind of change in technology, certainly um, National Film and Television School down in Beaconsfield does a lot with um, kind of really all the cutting edge things, and so I hope we are going to benefit from that, and we will be able to deliver um, whatever's whatever's required. But, but should that not be part of the strategy? But you're, you're obviously saying that we don't have a strategy in Scotland. That's why <laughs> I think it's so so difficult to grasp is, is how these decisions are taken and who's taking decisions. Uh, because, yeah. you know, if we want Scotland to be ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to screen mm -hmm. productions and film production in, say, 20 years or, or 15 years, we have to think now what are the skills that are going to be required then mm -hmm. and start training up people, yeah. just like we do if it was surgery in hospitals or mm -hmm. whether we do it with uh, um, in, in ICT. Yeah. So who's taking those decisions? Who's making sure it happens in Scotland? And, you know, is it happening? That's and what, what are the skills, by the way? What, what, what are your views of the skills that will get Scotland ahead of the game in, say, 10 years? I suspect, although I, I don't really know, but I imagine um, skills around uh, AR and VR and immersive narrative, I think that's kind of the area we're looking at. And I know that, the, that down at UWS, they're, they're looking at looking at doing work there. Yeah, up so, here in Scotland, what's happening? Well, no, in, that, so in, in the University of the West of Scotland, down oh, sorry, in the so, so yes. The, um, so I think I think you know people are aware of, so of is, that. So is work happening there on those? I, I, those I believe so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it, but we need to broaden it out. And I also think that to, to a huge extent, the skills that that, that we require now, will, we will, are going to continue to use. You know, the industry isn't going to change so much even in the next fifteen twenty years. And while I think there will be obviously technological advances and, ch and changes that you see, you know. 20 years ago with CGI, um, I think we can probably respond to those quite quickly. Once we once we have the intelligence to say this is what's happening next, we can be doing that. Something that we've lacked um, of past years is a, a data collected specifically about the landscape of um, the industry in Scotland on which decisions can be made kind of locally and um, creative skill set do skills surveys and there's other there's there's quite a few different other surveys that come around from time to time but it, again what we lack is the strategic consistency of an approach for collecting data to get an overall picture of the landscape in Scotland we generally funding is based on the figures that skill set will uh, collate and identified kind of skills gaps for the UK, which isn't necessarily reflective of the situation specifically in Scotland. So we welcome um, the um, 
survey that's being done by Skills Development Scotland and uh, Creative Scotland at the moment, but very much hope that that is an annual survey that becomes embedded in the industry. Uh, we are promoting it through both Hit the Ground Running and um, Vic to, to get the survey out to freelancers to try and get a realistic um, uh, picture of the landscape, a data-based um, evidence base from which decisions can be made because from experience you know there's certain grades there's certain parts of the industry who respond to surveys but for a lot of the freelance crew they don't because they're working and they work very long hours and it's it's not their thing so I think there has to be work done to reach out to get responses so that strategy that's built on that data isn't just biased towards the people who responded. Um, and furthermore, um, the data that's collected, uh, you know, should be available to the, the sector um, f for, yeah. for us all to access so that we're not constantly having different surveys of the same people. On that from uh, Claire Baker. Um, Thank you, Convener. Uh, Linda's comments on Skills Development Scotland are, are helpful. Um, we took evidence from Skills Development Scotland, one of the bodies that sit within the board, and we took evidence from them, um, along with Scottish Enterprise and, and other kind of key partners. And what is your experience? I mean, I'm struck by at the beginning, you said there's a lack of strategy and there's fragmentation. And I kind of think, well, where does Skills Development Scotland sit into this? Is this not partly their responsibility? And so I'd be interested in what your experience has been working with them. I do appreciate they are currently carrying out a survey and there's some activity being taken place, but they are the key partner within the new screen unit representing, I would, to my understanding, representing your sector. Um, are you confident that they understand the sector well enough to carry out that role? And what is your experience of working with them up to this point? I, th I think... Um, I think they do understand. I think David Martin understands the sector. He's got a lot of experience in it um, and in skills development. My own experience over the past few years has just been that, that um, SDS's focus has been pretty much primarily on apprenticeships and therefore there hasn't been space really to have a, a wider discussion about, about skills development. Um, and one of the things that I'm quite interested in as I know when, when the government was doing its consultation about the apprenticeships, uh, there was a question about a flexible fund. And as far as I understand, at the moment that's available to employers, uh, but for training which would be delivered through um, further and higher education. And so I wonder whether there's a, is a place for that flexible fund to be more flexible so that actually it's, it's more relevant for our sector because in fact if we're looking for you know if employers are looking for training it's probably not going to be from colleges and universities um so sorry that's a slightly separate point about the apprenticeships but i think um certainly in terms of sds it it, it feels has felt laterally um and until actually until the discussion around the screen unit as if the focus has been very very firmly on apprenticeships i don't know if that's other people's experience not had a, we've not had a lot of deal in our sector, but are now talking just over the last few weeks about uh, that kind of access sector that we belong to around the country taking on uh, foundation apprenticeships. Uh, so we actually host young people and, and then support them through their learning because they are at a different age. Uh, they're younger. They're maybe not ready for that college or uh, experience. And question marks around is is colleges the best place for that to be taking place? Because mm -hmm. uh, the way we work is we can work uh, quite intensively with small groups and and do quite a lot of work. Uh, and so there's more discussions to have. That's the main part of what we've been dealing with, alongside at times doing the certificate for work readiness with certain young people and stuff. So that that's our experience of that. Okay, see that. Um, so the two parts. I, I, we have worked with SDS um, on the modern apprenticeships, and we've been doing that for the last two years. But I want to focus on the point you made about gathering skills data. We started conversations with SDS, and I would really, I hope we can work in a very collaborative way. And the reason for that is, I think you're absolutely right that some t uh, in the past, Creative Skills Set used to do censuses. In my view. Um, and I would say that because I come from a different world. Um, they weren't as business intelligent as they might be. They weren't responsive. You do a survey once a year, it doesn't really give you the pain points in a sharp, detailed way. I also think within our sector, I'm talking in general, we don't have an agreed approach to 
the lexicon or the taxonomy, as you describe it, in terms of different job roles and classifications. The government data centrally doesn't have that. So what we're trying to do now in this new guise is actually work in collaboration. So when we look at job roles or look at skill shortages, we can go down a granular detail. So the approach can be consistent, hopefully across the UK, because the industry is global. But where SDS would be absolutely brilliant is to have more detailed place-based data. And if we're doing horizon scanning sometimes, can we share? Because the more collaborative we are, the more it helps everybody. So that's what I would welcome, a really in a collaborative approach where we know what SDS is doing, they know what we're doing, we share information, we work together. Because, you know, if we do, I think everybody wins. OK, thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> We've talked about SDS delivering apprenticeships. The Scottish Funding Council has agreed to support a single network of colleges and universities across the creative industry um, to focus on the sector's needs. I just wondered if witnesses were aware of that and what their views were on that proposal. I'm, I'm aware of it, um, and that's that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Ross Greer. Thanks. Just like to come back to the points around um, school level um, education. I think we as a committee were quite impressed by the approach taken in Northern Ireland to this, uh, both when we went over and it's came up quite consistently in the written evidence and, and oral evidence given to us over the last few weeks. The One of the key differences, obviously a number, but Northern Ireland has a thriving industry. It also has a far smaller population and geographically it's far uh, easier to get round because the approach taken there um, was all essentially a school by school approach that the industry was able to work with individual schools to develop that kind of uh, that culture and, and that um, appreciation for the, the subjects that's obviously a much more challenging approach to take here if you're to, to get around everywhere so it would seem that approaching through local authorities and education scotland is a, a more effective way to try and get that overall reach but whose responsibility would that ultimately be? Because it seems the way it's it's happened in Scotland so far is uh, within the industry, uh, individuals or organisations have taken the initiative and tried to reach as many schools as they can, but there's no overarching strategy and overarching responsibility that you presume would come from a public body to make sure that that approach is being taken within every education authority. So who should be taking the lead on that? It would have to be it would be the education within the film unit, uh, which is uh, currently. Well, I it will go through the, the change in whoever's in charge of education. It has to be that lead. But I know historically, even going back to the Scottish Screen days, there's been a preference for going down that route uh, of Northern Ireland, which wasn't taken up by government and wasn't taken up by Education Scotland and wasn't taken up by SKA. So actually. The industry body the whole time has been saying this is what we need, and it's the other side, the educational body, saying it's not what we need. So mm. there's a kind of a log jam that is maybe needing you guys to sort out, <laughs> I would say. And I know in the Northern Ireland thing, it is, it's more than just an individual school approach, it's, it's across that entire, uh, that entire small country because everybody takes up moving image arts. Uh, and we've ran that for three years. So we've our tutor team go over to Northern Ireland once a year, catch up for two days of training and stuff, catch up with teachers that are delivering all of this. And sadly, just to do with the, the setup of Creative Scotland, that now ends, that ends next month, and we can't run it again eh, because wider Creative Scotland doesn't, doesn't see the role. So it's not the film team, but wider Creative Scotland, there's an issue of doesn't see their role as eh, funding qualifications. Except what we were actually using it for was beyond school age as well as taking young people that really needed it to get themselves progressed industry-wise or to university and maybe come from more challenging backgrounds. So I, I would say overall uh, film unit's responsibility, Just engaging. On the last point you mentioned there yeah. about Creative Scotland, uh, over, mm -hmm. the overall uh, body not seeing the opportunity there, is your hope then that with the screen unit there would be an opportunity to revisit that? Uh, I would hope so. I would hope so. But I think on a Scotland-wide basis, because this year actually it was, it was we'd also support Needham Court in Inverness, so it's getting run in uh, Inverness as well. And actually quite sad that it's running for a year and then stops. Uh, so again, it's just that hodgepodge of things that are happening. Uh, and I think organisations like ourselves, it's about working with us to work with schools as well. And 
education departments. Luckily in Edinburgh, it's quite strong because we are heavily part of that department, funding-wise and stuff, and agreement-wise. But elsewhere, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. And just on a different note, um, looking at public service <coughs> broadcasters, obviously the, the BBC, um, their responsibility, their public service, is to do more than just create entertaining content. And there, there's a responsibility there to create the kind of in-work opportunities to develop the industry overall. I think that seems to have happened quite successfully in Wales off the back of what spun out of, of Doctor Who and Torchwood and the industry there. Um, do you think that the BBC in Scotland have a clear sense of their responsibility to the wider industry and their responsibility to workforce development? I think they do. I think it comes back to content. Um, you know, I think I think they, they do understand that. And certainly, I know they've supported the drama training programme, which Linda's running and which I used to run. Um, but, it, but it does come back to, to the programmes. We need the programmes for people to, to get that workplace experience on. But hopefully, with you know the investment and the new channel, yeah. those those opportunities are going to be there. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Can I just ask you to go back to what you just said about Creative Scotland, wider Creative Scotland, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, not understanding the the program that you were running uh, with Northern Ireland? What kind of conversations did you have with Creative Scotland around that? Presumably the. They did fund it at one point, and then they changed I, it, their minds. So was, could you, I just wonder if you could give us more detail about it. There wasn't much. Basically, it was the person who previously was running our organisation who left back in October. Uh, just once the funding came through and stuff, uh, the, the note then came through for a meeting and basically got informed that this we're funding it for this year. Uh, it was the first time Creative Scotland directly funded it. For the previous two years, it was Scottish Film Education that funded it, mm -hmm. which is obviously a bit of uh, money from BFI, but also Creative Scotland. Uh, again, as a test pilot, because their role was obviously to to CPD the teachers in Scotland as much as they can in clusters, and wanted to try that out as well. And then, so it was basically it was a wider than the film team was. We'll do it this one year, and then basically it's not a role. It, it's kind of seen as school for their ed and higher education to be doing qualifications and stuff. Except actually a lot of the young people we work with, uh, going through a lot of the programmes, some of their only qualifications are actually with us in film. You know, it's kids that have been in and out of school and things like that, kids that have been in care. Uh, and then others that just uh, needed that kind of qualification to get them towards film school at Napier and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a great it's a great programme, but it'd be very worthwhile actually being in the Scottish curriculum and supported properly. Mm -hmm. uh, with the kind of infrastructure over there, there's organisations similar to us, uh, the Nerve Centre, there's one in Derry, there's one in Belfast, and they kind of support that whole infrastructure of moving image arts across yeah. Northern Ireland. And that's part of the Northern Ireland Screen Agency, that's their yep. remit, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, so these opportunities have been lost in Inverness, because that's another thing that we've sort mm -hmm. of touched on in this session, the, the need to reach out and provide training and opportunities right across Scotland. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just mention, uh, ask you a little bit more about something else? You mentioned, uh, I think it was Linda in particular, mentioned the new entrance training scheme and uh, you're not the only person to have praised it. We've got a lot of written and oral evidence that have praised that scheme. The kind of tone of that praise tends to be almost as if it's something from the, the past. Um, I wonder if you could tell us currently what, what its status is or, or why people are talking about it almost as if it's something that's in the past. Why isn't it still happening if everybody agrees that it's so great? I think they talk about it in that way because it's been running for such a long time. It right. was, as far as I'm aware, the first pl structured sort of placement-based training program in the UK, um, because it was about four, 1979, I think, is when it started, and it's been through different guises across that, um, uh, across the, the 40 years. Um, it's sort of changed its uh, uh, the way in which it's been delivered, but. It has uh, the respect of the industry because many people have been through it. I have been through it, <laughs> um, uh, but it, you know, provides a really valuable way in for people who um, haven't got any connections with the industry. And previous to that existing, it was all you know, families, members, and neighbours who were working in the industry. Um, 
Uh, the last time it was funded was through the Screen Skills Fund, which um, uh, came through Creative Scotland. There was a million pounds for skills. Uh, that was a number of years ago now, um, uh, and it was delivered um, at that point for around about a year, I think, with, with only four trainees. Part of the model is it's small numbers of um, individuals who are um, placed within specific departments, and those are identified based on... How, what the industry's need is, you know, uh, looking really on a granular level at what, um, it, because it's specifically for drama mostly, so uh, where are the gaps coming up? So it's anticipating that. So what it provided was a constant stream of really high quality training um, and a really high success rate because of the recruitment procedures and the buy-in from the industry to train those individuals. And we're kind of suffering for the lack of it now. Why we have skills gaps at a kind of higher level is the lack of continuity of providing that stream. Um, we, we aren't a big industry. You know, it's very specific um, areas where we can um, have interventions. We, we, we would struggle with a big increase in um, the uh, volume of new entrants um, who are looking to work in the industry in terms of the capacity to accommodate them. So what the new entrance programme does is, uh, is responsive to the needs of the industry. Where it's at at the moment is there was no repeat funding for the Screen Skills Fund and it's, uh, it's an expensive programme to run because it's fully funded um, for the individuals who are um, right. being the trainees well, and it's well, supported. Given that we all agree that we're currently in a boom uh, I take it we would all agree that, that if, if there was one thing that we could do, funding that programme that everyone thinks is wonderful is really something that we ought to be doing pronto, really. Yeah. OK, with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for giving your evidence today. It's been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I will have a short suspension of the committee. Thank you. We'll now move into private session, rather. Thank you.